Good afternoon, you're all very welcome here this afternoon to the Park Hotel. Uh, welcome to the Pension Roadshow presented by the Baptist Pension Scheme Employers Group. My name is Frances Bloomfield, I'm the convener of the Baptist Union Scotland and I'm chairing this afternoon's meeting. Welcome too to the people who will be watching this online. You'll note that this presentation is being videoed. Housekeeping for those of us who are here in person. There is no fire alarm test scheduled for today. So if you hear the fire alarm, please could you file out the doors at the back, through the foyer, to the front of the hotel, or through this exit on my left, your right, and round the service road at the back of the hotel, to the front of the hotel, to the flags at the front of the car park. The pattern for this afternoon is a set presentation being given to us by Alan Donaldson, who's the General Director of the Baptist Union of Scotland, but he's here in his capacity as a member of the Employers Group for the Baptist Pension Scheme. We will then have a 20 minute coffee break, and that will be followed by a question and answer session with a panel who will be at my left. On the panel today are Alan Donaldson, Peter Dick, the Baptist Union's Finance Director, and Jonathan Innes from Innocent Partners Accountants. They will each advise you of their personal interests and any conflicting interests they have before they speak. Can I mention that when we come to the question and answer session, and please, no questions during the set or presentation or immediately after the set presentation, keep your questions to the question and answer session. Please would you make sure that your questions are general. The panel cannot answer individual questions this afternoon. This is not the forum for that. And finally, could you put the questions through me, please, as the chair? Before we start, though, it's my pleasure to invite the Reverend Andy Hayes to come forward and lead us in an opening prayer. Thank you, Andy. Faced with the uh, uncertainties and vagaries of pensions and investments, I wanted to remind you of one investment we can uh, count on. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. That's the kind of investment we like <laughs> and we want to hold on to. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you now and we submit to you, to your leading, to your guiding. Please have your way among us and show us your way. Lord, we come with many questions. Lead us to answers. Show us a way forward. Enable us to find in one another your leading and guiding this afternoon. Lord, help us to settle those concerns of our hearts peaceably and lovingly and enable us, Lord, to hear one another in the light of all that you want to reveal to us through this presentation. And we pray especially for Alan now as he comes to speak and share with us. Would you enable him to speak clearly and enable us, Lord, to hear very acutely what he is speaking to us so that we may understand uh, what it is that we need to know. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Uh, we are anticipating that this room was actually sold out ticket-wise. So if you've got an empty seat with you, don't assume it will be empty by the time we get to the end. Uh, every ticket, in fact, we had people we eventually had to say, I'm sorry, there is no more space. And they're joining us uh, on Facebook Live uh, right now. And the recording of that will then make its way uh, to our website. Um, I'm here today in a slightly different capacity from the one you normally see me in. Um, kind of not here as the General Director of the Baptist Union of Scotland, but I'm here as a member of the Employers Group. 
and I will in the presentation use the word we several times. Please do not misunderstand that as a we referring to the Baptist Union of Scotland, which is my normal use of the word. The we is a reference to the employers group throughout, and I'll explain who the employers group is in a few minutes' time. I have a PowerPoint that goes to about 24, 25 slides. We will make that available as a, as a download from our website uh, in a couple of days' time when I get back to the office. I have an employer's pension group meeting tomorrow in Birmingham, so it won't happen tomorrow. But as soon as we get a chance to upload it, it will be sitting next to the video so that you can re-watch the video if you find it so <laughs> gripping. And uh, you can watch uh, the, take uh, the PowerPoint slides away to help remind you of what we've spoken about today. Just a few more words about the Employers Group. The Employers Group is funded by the Baptist Union of Great Britain. It takes a, a, a several thousand pounds to make that group function on a yearly basis, and uh, that's where the funding for the Employers Group comes from. Today, your being here, your teas and coffees, is funded by the Baptist Union of Scotland. Um, other things, just to declare my own conflicts of interest in this whole matter, as General Director of the Baptist Union of Scotland, uh, the Baptist Union of Scotland is the largest employer uh, debt, we believe, in Scotland. And uh, so I have an interest in that debt. I am also a Baptist minister who is a member of the scheme and would hope one day to benefit from the funds in that scheme. I'm also a member of a Baptist church that has a debt within that scheme. And I'm also on the Council of the Baptist Union of Great Britain, who is the biggest single debtor in the scheme, and I'm part of their decision-making body, their council. So you understand right away that there are several conflicts, and, and everybody who's involved in this, those conflicts are regularly noted and stated as meetings begin and are held on record because it is a family issue, and that, therefore we find ourselves with cross-conflicts at several points. I've said, uh, Francis has already said for us there will be questions at the end and I'll be joined by Peter Dick and Jonathan Innes for that. And um, this seminar that you are hearing today will be repeated almost verbatim um, in the regions of England. So there'll be another 12 outings of this seminar. I'm not doing them all. I'm just doing the one here. Uh, but it will be being repeated in the same format right across the Baptist Union of Great Britain and in some parts of Wales in order that churches across these parts can hear. Uh, we are the second to go and by far we are the busiest. So here we go. The employers group uh, was introduced at the beginning of 2016 to represent the interests of all the employers in the Baptist Pension Scheme. Half of the group were nominated by the Baptist Union of Great Britain trustees and the other half have been elected from a recruitment process involving applications and interviews which I believe happened south of the border. The members of the group are identified on the slide here and some months later it was recognised that there was no one from Scotland on the group and I was invited to attend the group. Why are we here today? Well, here are some of the things I hope to cover in this presentation. Firstly, the big picture, an update on the 2016 actuarial valuation and the family solution for a family problem and the whole concept that we've been dreaming up as a group. Secondly, what about my church? We're going to have a little bit of a look at individual church employer debts, how they're calculated, etc. <coughs> and we're going to look at the new draft employer debt regulations. We'll then move on to the employment covenant so that you understand what that is and the implications it has on the debts and uh, the recording pension information in your church accounts and how you might do that uh, going forward from here. We hope that by coming here today you'll not only find it useful to know what we've been doing over the last year or so, but also how you can help in achieving our aim. We recognise we have a crisis in the pension scheme where the pension deficit has increased substantially in just three years from the last valuation. So we set ourselves a very ambitious plan to eradicate the deficit within 10 years or sooner. And the question that we asked ourselves as a group was, 
How can we achieve our aim to enable our churches to be free of the debt burden, freeing up resources for missional objectives? And over the following slides, I want to tell the story so far. The big picture and an update on the 2016 actuarial valuation. At the last valuation, the scheme had a deficit of 84 million. And the Pension Trustee and the Baptist Union of Great Britain, as a principal employer of the scheme, agreed to increase the deficit contribution rate to 12%. Most of you will be familiar with that. The recovery period was also slightly extended from the 31st of December 2034 to the 30th of June 2035. This amended recovery plan was agreed with the pension regulator, so in the period since the 31st of December 2013, have things improved or got worse is the big question. And over the next two slides we're going to show uh, what happened. Don't worry, there's some big words to come up. <coughs> LCP are the schemes actuaries and they have a daily online service available to the pension trustee which provides them with up-to-date picture of how the scheme is performing. And that's what the pension trustee board can see. That's taken from the 9th of June 2017. Now, I've overlapped the graphics so that you can see some things. The key headlines. Liabilities have increased from 245 0.5 million to 349.8 million. That is a 42% increase. Second thing, the buyout cost has increased from 288.2 million to 387.7 million. That's a 34% increase. Now, if you're wondering what a buyout cost is, that is the cost of exiting the scheme and moving it away to, say, uh, an insurance company who would buy the debt, guarantee the pensions, and that's how much it would cost to do such a thing. And thirdly, investments in the scheme have risen from 161.5 million to 229.7 million, an increase of also 42%. Now, these figures shown are of the date shown there, but they're very similar to the, the figures of the position of the 31st of December 2016, which is the date of the current valuation. This graph is maybe a little easier to understand. This graph begins with the deficit as of the 31st of December 2013, and the straight line that you see, the thin straight line running from left to right, is where if the current recovery plan was working, the jagged line running underneath would be, i.e. when we set out at the beginning of January 14, that was the plan to keep that jagged line along the thin red line. You will see that that has not happened. The gap between the two lines has widened, the result of which means the scheme deficit has increased to 100 and 10 million. That is a current position of being 44.6 million behind on the recovery plan. Why? Why has the scheme deficit increased? How would a scheme deficit like ours increase so dramatically in the space of just three years? Did we as a family get it wrong the last time? How have other <coughs> denominations fared? How have other pension schemes like ours fared in the same economic climate? These are all very valid questions. And so to look for answers, we have gone to the pension regulator. So here on this slide, we show the key findings of the recent report from the regulator that clearly shows we are not alone in facing the kind of pension deficits other organisations also have to deal with them. It's worth saying more at this point about the performance of the investments, as often we hear comments like, the reason for the deficit is poor performance of the scheme's investment. We do not believe that that is correct. The scheme assets have been performing well, 
bolstered by the fact that the trustees have used a type of investment designed to protect against movement in the gilt yield. These assets are known as liability-driven investments. Bear with me, folks, it's technical. When short-term interest rates, such as bank base rates, reduce, the expected return on long-term government bonds, gilts, on which pension liabilities are based, they also fall, and that forces pension liability values up. Interest rates have stayed at record low levels for much longer than predicted, and at the end of 2016, the return on gilts was half what it was at the end of 2013, leading to a commensurate rise in the scheme liabilities. Now, when the scheme liabilities increase, the liability-driven investment assets go up in value too. But because we started from a point where the scheme was in deficit and the assets were lower, then the liabilities, a 42% increase in both, also means the shortfall increases in absolute terms. Now, our investments are benchmarked against various uh, indices, including how the scheme performs in relation to LCP's other pension clients. LCP has told the pension scheme that the Baptist Pension Scheme was in the top 20% of returns over the year to the 30th of September 2016, and in the top 25% of returns over the three-year period to the 30th of September 2016. So we have a combination of factors that are resulting in the increased deficit. If we do nothing, and some firms like HSBC and Tesco can put in huge sums of money uh, to meet their scheme deficits, unfortunately the Baptist family doesn't have these kinds of resources, nor is there any silver bullet that we can turn to. Options for us are very few. We can consider further extending the period of recovery plan, but it would seem unlikely that the pension regulator would agree to that, since we already have one of the longest recoveries for pension plans in the pension industry. The employers group also reflected on the last pension roadshows where there was a clear message not to leave the problem for a future generation. So to keep the current recovery plan would mean at least a 25% increase in the contribution rate from 12 to 15%. And if we want to reduce the recovery period, we would need to consider increasing the contribution rate potentially to 18%. There is clearly potential impacts of increased deficit contributions. On this slide, I want to show what churches pay now as a minimum. And secondly, what churches might have to pay if the increase in deficit contribution rate rose from 12 to 15 or even to 18%. Now, I need to say this slide comes with an extremely strong health warning. <laughs> Please do not go away from here thinking that this will happen. The decisions have not yet been made. Nothing is yet decided. The recovery plan for the current valuation has yet to be fully discussed and agreed between the pension trustees, the employers group and the Baptist Union of Great Britain trustees. And in fact, your input later today will be used as part of the decision making process and will be brought into account. So please hear that health warning as we look at this slide. Uh, together. So most of you are used to paying the 3,420 per annum and if I just go off script a moment, that calculated figure of 28.5 is actually the Baptist Union of Great Britain's <coughs> minimum stipend plus the housing allowance which is £6,000. It does not relate to the Scottish Baptist uh, recommended stipend which is a considerably higher figure. So this is based on the English figures, and that's the figures that you use for your contributions. So uh, the minimum contribution currently is generally 3420. 
possible increases would be. Um, you can see the English stipend increase plus the man's allowance reaching a new figure of 28,750 times 15% would lead you to payments of 4,313 per annum. And of course, the 18% figure on the same figures reaches £5,175 per annum. We also need to take into consideration what the pension regulator has to say about future recovery plans. The choice is not solely in our hands. It's important for all of us that we appreciate the role, firstly, of the pension trustees in this presentation. The trustees themselves are drawn from our own Baptist churches. <coughs> they are not people to be demonised. They are not people to be spoken badly of. In fact, they are people who are held in the highest esteem in our churches and are asked to do one of the most difficult jobs that we have asked anyone to do for our Baptist family. They are to be highly honoured and thanked for the gracious way they have taken on one of the most difficult and impossible tasks, not only of this generation, but of the history of our Baptist family in Great Britain. And certainly I know the employers group would want to say that of the Baptist pension trustees. And I know I'm a bit off script on that, but I want to be crystal clear about the appreciation we have in Scotland for the work that they are doing. It has all sorts of ramifications for them. They are often conflicted in themselves. The pension scheme is regulated by the pension regulator and therefore we have to take into account the guidance and the statements issued by the regulator. The pension regulator has recently published guidance for the annual funding statement for defined benefit pension schemes. The statement is relevant to trustees and employers of all defined benefit pension schemes, but is primarily aimed at those undertaking valuations with effective dates between the 22nd of September 2016 and the 21st of September 2017, which includes the Baptist pension scheme. The statement makes clear that pension trustees should seek higher contributions now to mitigate against the risk of the employer covenant weakening and other scheme risks materialising in the future. Taking that statement at its most literal, it would seem we may not have a choice but to increase deficit contributions. So this leads us to the question on the possible impact on your church if deficit contributions need to increase to the sort of figures that I showed just a slide earlier. So just for a few moments, in part just to give my voice rest, I actually want you to turn to the folks who are just sitting around you, preferably in the direction of someone who's not with you from your church, if that's possible, and ask the question of one another, what would the impact be of these sorts of, I'll go back so you can see the figures, of these sorts of increases in your church, i.e. if it was to go up £1,000 or approximately £2,000. What would that impact be on your church? And you might want to categorise it in these sort of categories. No impact whatsoever. We'll find the money. Some impact may affect our disposable income, but not much. Some impact may affect what we can give away or spend on mission and buildings. Big impact may not be able to afford full or part-time ministry if that's the position you're in. Even bigger impact may result in the church closure. You just think about which category it might fall in and just turn and share with one another what it might mean for you if it was to go from three to four or even four to five. And we'll just take a few minutes to do it.
As I have a, a pension employers group meeting tomorrow, I'd like to actually take them back a straw poll of our answer to these questions. So uh, Jenny, my PA, is standing at the back with pen and paper, uh, just so I can take a note and take it back to the employers group tomorrow. So uh, amongst you, as you discussed there, if those were to increase by that middle ground, let's suggest, let's take the middle ground because it's a good enough one to measure by, by approximately £1,000 per annum. Uh, who is thinking, do you know, that's going to have no impact on us? Uh, we're in a fortunate situation, we'll find the money. If, if you could just give us a quick show of hands and keep them up for a minute just to allow me just to, to clock how many people we're at. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. It doesn't, that's lovely, thank you very much. Some impact that may affect our disposable income. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, twenty, fifty, sixty, seventy, twenty. Uh, some impact may affect what we can give away, spend on mission buildings, etc. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eight, nine, twenty, twenty. A couple of dozen, thank you. Big impact may not be able to afford full or part-time ministry, so it would affect the model of ministry that you've got just now. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And finally, big impact could result in church closure. One, two. Okay, thank you very much for that. As an employer's group, we recognise there are further potential negative outcomes for the wider Baptist family if deficit contributions have to increase. And let me just share some of them that, 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 that we've picked up on. The reduced ability to fund ministry in the local church, which is what we've essentially uh, been talking about there. Reduced Scottish Baptist fund giving, reduced BMS giving, reduced other mission organisation giving that your church chooses to do. Reduced ability to fund ministerial development. Many of our churches have become uh, familiar with uh, paying for ministers to go on training courses and development courses and see that as part and parcel of having a minister these days supporting their continual ministerial development and we recognise that that might be seen as a budget that gets cut. Reduced support of our Scottish Baptist College and its ongoing work in training ministers for generations to come. Reduced support for other mission agencies in Scotland and around the world. All of the money that we spend on these pensions things have an impact on mission and ministry in a variety of ways. And that is why we've been trying to find some form of family solution for a family problem. If we are truly a family, what happens in most families when difficulties arise is the family pulls together to solve the problem. So in the same way the employers group have adopted the idea of a family solution in its thinking and in its prayers. You might ask, well, what have they done and what is that looking like? Firstly, we've simply tried to recognise the strain of the deficit in churches across the Baptist family. We've listened to that. We've been trying to listen to it over and over again in different places. We've also been listening to associations. If you understand, down in the Baptist Union of Great Britain, they are subdivided into 13 regional groupings called associations. And they had a conversation, and in that conversation between churches and associations, um, they were saying constantly to us, can you solve this problem in this generation? We don't want to be handing it on to a generation that is to come. So our first meeting as, a, as an employer's group, uh, we pulled together a specialist pension consultancy firm, one that specialised in dealing with radical uh, recovery plans. 
And that was really the beginning of the employers group's creative base phase in thinking through what might be a family solution. And we began testing some of our ideas with the pension trustees, people like Chris Maggs and Mark Hines, that some of you will have spoken to and be familiar with. We've talked to the Baptist Steering Group, which is kind of a, a key committee in the Baptist Union of Great Britain that runs um, their union for them. And uh, we, we've come towards a family solution as a concept. And we will share some of that with you. And the family solution involves using some centrally held family assets to help reduce the scheme deficit. This would immediately improve the scheme's financial position and reduce the impact of the changes since the 2013 valuation. All the associations in England and Wales, all the unions, the Baptist Union of Great Britain and Scotland and Wales, and all the colleges have been approached to support the family solution. Having spoken with all these organisations, it's kind of time to speak with you and share some of the results of that. Essentially, this is the church's scheme and we need to hear your views on what we're doing and your views on how you might also be able to help us reach this family solution. And we recognise that as church leaders and as ministers, you may have different and conflicting views from one another. That would not surprise us because we experience that when we meet together ourselves. Discussions with all parties are continuing we are not there yet. I'm not here to say we've got X amount of pounds today. Um, we can't say that with any degree of certainty. The extent to which we will deliver the family solution comes down to how well we all come together after these groups of seminars and how we work things through in the next six months. But let me assure you the employers group is totally focused on delivering an outcome which helps all of our churches. As I say, we're not yet at a point where we can share openly what the financial family solution is, except in broad outline. But the next slide is going to show you some of the details. As I said earlier, there isn't a stack of Baptist money sitting around somewhere, or assets lying around somewhere, in some Baptist house somewhere, that would solve the crisis. Of course, the Baptist family overall does have cash. It does have investments, it does have property assets that could certainly help eradicate the deficit. But there is no silver bullet here. There is no one organisation that can solve this crisis on its own. The purpose of the so-called family solution is to say that together, using resources that we do have between us, unions, associations, colleges, churches, retirees and future retirees, current ministers, that we could join together to achieve a common aim, recognising that everyone involved will be affected, but taking a fair and reasonable step for everyone to achieve our goal. The solution lies within three broad categories. The first is with cash. We know even at this stage that an injection of cash into the scheme will have a positive impact on the current valuation. So the employers group wrote to every union, every association and every college to ask for a gift, to ask for help. It's too early to tell you what all the responses are from each of these, but we can tell you what we've asked for. From the Baptist Union of Great Britain, we have asked them to release cash from their union's designated funds and to place a lump sum into the scheme as a gift, and in addition, maintaining and growing a pension reserve to help those churches which may need help dealing with a pension debt and where there are no or insufficient assets to cover closed churches, removing any threat of a liability falling upon <coughs> individual trustees, except in a situation where a breach of trust has taken place with those trustees. And in writing to associations and colleges, to the Baptist Union of Scotland and to the Baptist Union of Wales, as an employers group, we've asked each of these to donate £50,000 each from their reserves in cash to the scheme, either now or over a period of three to five years. And if they all agree, that will inject one million into the scheme. 
over the period of the time, again as a free will gift. We've also asked associations and our union to set up a pension reserve fund of their own or to join with the union's pension reserve fund down south to deal with future closed churches who may not have enough assets to cover a pension debt to ensure that no trustee is ever called upon to satisfy a debt from their own resources, save where a trustee or trustees act improperly. We have recommended that associations and unions like yourself should use the proceeds from the sale of closed churches to set up that pension reserve fund and to fill that pension reserve fund. We have also approached unions and associations with regard to past closed churches. That is, churches that have closed in the last few years not knowing that they had a pension deficit and are now no more. They are a relatively small number of churches in that category and in these cases the employers group sought financial support from the Baptist Union of Great Britain, from the Baptist Union of Scotland and from some of the associations who had churches in their area that had closed and were pleased to advise that a commitment has already been given to clear these debts by the individual bodies. Indeed, most of the nearly £800,000 involved has already been received and put into the fund. And then we ask the question of churches. Maybe even more so of churches that are not in this room because they are not affected. Is there cash available in church reserves that could offer a contribution or donation beyond that of the mandatory deficit contributions that most of you will be making. Could churches not in the pension scheme now, but maybe they were in the past or they just recognise the hardship <coughs> of all the churches that are in it, make a voluntary do don eh, donation from their reserve. For example, a bold statement, if every church gave a 10% gift of its unrestricted cash reserves, we would raise 10 million to put into the fund. And we'd be open to hear other suggestions of how churches can play their part in this. That's the first thing, the cash injection. Secondly, we think it may be possible to add investments to the pension that the pension trustees hold and, or, sorry, and or provide a significant further input of cash now this is an extremely confidential area, so I'm not going to be open in front of everyone here. But at this stage, it's too early to say where it might come from. But we are looking at a figure in the region of a further £20 million being released to be gifted to the scheme, which you would understand would make a significant contribution in terms of either an investment that will be given to the pension trustees on an investment that will be released and turned into cash to give as additional security to the fund. Thirdly, we're in discussion with the pension trustee about the assumptions that are made in the current actuarial valuation, which could, if the pension trustee agree, could reduce the liabilities in the scheme. Ministers will want to listen very carefully here. Currently, pension increases are based on changes in the retail price index. I'm just going to call it RPI from now. Retail price index. This is one measure of inflation. It's a measure that's produced by the government. The employer group has proposed as part of the family solution that this is changed from the retail price index to the consumer price index. So to swap RPI to CPI. Now let me tell you the arguments to and for this. Arguments for the change. CPI, we believe, is arguably a better measure for actual inflation than RPI, as the RPI calculation is known to use a flawed formula which overstates inflation by around 0.8% per annum. A move to CPI will still provide protection against inflation to pensioners, which was the original t intention when the scheme was set up, but would reduce the deficit on the pension scheme by around 18 million. Most 
public sector DB pension schemes in the UK have moved from RPI to CPI, and some private sector schemes <coughs> where the rules permit the change have also moved from RPI to CPI. The pension trustee can, in accordance with the scheme rules, choose any suitable cost of living index, including those published by the Office of National Statistics, provided it's notified to all affected members. The family solution is a package of measures of which moving from RPI to CPI is part of the solution, aimed at reducing the recovery plan period and ensuring that the burden upon churches for deficit contributions does not increase overall going forward. There are, of course, arguments against that change. It is usually the case that RPI is higher than CPI, and so the actual pension paid to pensioners would be lower in future years if the change is made. For example, a pension of, say, £10,000 in 2007 would have increased to 13,344 in 2017 using the RPI based increase, but it would only increase to £12,550 using the CPI based increase. Both inflationary increases, but significantly different. <laughs> Any decision to change the index rests with the trustees of the Baptist Pension Scheme. And if change only affects pension payments from the date of the change, at the end of the presentation, I'll be asking for your opinion on this and on other related matters in a short questionnaire that you'll be given and would actually like you to give us back by the end of the session. The aggregate of all of these solutions that I've outlined could cut the deficit by over 40 million and put the Baptist family on track for a 10-year recovery period if all other things remain equal, which you just about say with every line in pensions. I'm going to move on to a different area now. Estimated employer debts explained. So, by now, your church treasurer, and perhaps one other, will have access to what is called the Automated Monthly Debt Estimate. They're only available to churches with a current active member or a church that's in a period of grace. If you don't have an active member, but there's a historical cessation event, then the debt needs to be calculated manually. The AMDE explanation document is available from the LCP Employers Hub. It includes a paragraph highlighting whether a church also has a pre previous historical cessation event. Really, you should all be familiar with that by now. At the beginning of this presentation, I showed that snapshot, remember, of the LCP screen with all the graphs and charts that nobody could read from a distance because the writing was too small. Well, that chart gets shown on any given day what's happening to the pension deficit. It would be far too costly to make it available to every single church. But every month, LCP will update your individual church deficit using the employer's hub. The figure quoted represents your individual church liability to the scheme. And it's really, really important that your church treasurer not only has access to the hub, but also that he or she makes the church liability figure known to the leaders of the church, in particular the trustees, but also church members not least because in the future churches are going to have to make a disclosure in some form as to that liability in the pension scheme in your annual accounts. So going back to what we said earlier, the buyout estimate for the scheme on the 9th of June was 387.7 million. The liability figure quoted on the hub for your church is your share of the scheme deficit between the total liabilities and the total assets. And those of you who love percentages can just do the sums and work out what percentage of the total you have. Sad, isn't it? I know people who do it. <laughs> there is also on the LCP Hub a letter to churches which explains in a lot more detail all of the bullet points on that slide. So we're going to concentrate on, on the last uh, bullet point. 
what does my church do next? But before I do, let me just say, uh, we'll, and we'll come back to sensation events in a minute because that, that, that affects it as well. As one action point to, t to take away with you today, you might want to ensure that every minister, every church officer, every deacon, leader, trustee has a copy of the letter, the LCP hub letter. You can print it off and pass it, pass it round them so that they actually see it for themselves. They do have responsibilities in this area. You may think you're protecting them from something, but it's their liabilities and responsibilities as thing lie. And I think it's important personally for them to have a copy of that letter and to know what's in it. So having this information, what are you going to do next? Well, the letter makes absolutely clear you don't need to take any action as a result of the information contained in the document, which is for guidance only. It simply provides an estimate of the employer debt that your church or organisation would need to pay if it were to exit the defined benefit section of the Baptist Pension Scheme by paying its employer debt immediately. If you're going on that hub and getting a figure, it's an estimate. You don't have to pay it off. You don't need to panic. It's not tomorrow that somebody's coming looking for the bill. When you know your own church liability in the scheme, you may consider that buying out of the scheme, given the amount involved, would be achievable. Perhaps through individual donations, fundraising, taking up a loan or a mortgage. And if that is the case, there are a number of things I think you should be considering. The employer group, of course, is not here to give advice on that. We're not allowed to. We're not qualified to do so. We're not sure to do so. But you should always seek professional advice in such matters. Other considerations include the outcome of the new draft employer's debt regulations that have been issued by the Department of Work and Pensions. More about that later, but you're going to have to take that into consideration. And the final recovery plan that will be agreed between the pension and the BUGB trustees. And fight, you need to wait for that to come, I would suggest, to, to make final decisions. And finally, the impact on the scheme of those churches who can afford to exit, who do buy out, that will have an impact on the scheme as well and affect your debt because it's money coming in to the pot. I'm suspecting that will be the area where there will be significant questions from you later on as to should we be buying out or not. Don't give me them just now, but I'm just noting if you've got a question along that line, write it down just now just so you don't forget so you can ask it later on. Slide 19. How can I find out what my debt is if you don't know? Well, your church treasurer should be able to access the information via the hub. The information is on the internet. The slide demonstrates exactly how you do it. You just follow the click, 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 click. Most of you will have done that. Most churches have got one, sometimes two people who are registered with an email address and a password and can go on and access the information. The estimated debt figure is updated every month, so you can see how it's changing due to how the assets and liabilities of the scheme perform, and it's recommended that those people who are authorised to access the information update the church trustees periodically. <coughs> you don't need to do it every week, but periodically. Guidance will be available in due course about how to declare the information on your annual accounts, and maybe Jonathan will say something about that later on when he's questioned. Cessation events. The employers group is only all too aware of the issues surrounding cessation events and the worry and the anxiety felt by many churches. We also recognise the consequences of unfair legislation which has brought about issues confronting many of our churches, concerning in particular double session events. We're going to learn new language today. Just to put you in the picture, employers with one or more cessation event, 668. Employers with two or more cessation events, 43. They are part of the 668. Employers with the potential to have a cessation event, i.e. you have a minister who's part of the old DD scheme, who could retire or leave, etc., 349. So there's still a lot of people there who could fall foul of cessation event legislation. The scheme trustee is in discussion with the vast majority of historical cessation event cases where the employer doesn't have a current active member. There are a small number of churches with historical cessation events 
which has raised specific queries about enrolling a new member, a new minister, uh, starting with that church or through auto enrolment or whatever. We understand that the scheme trustee has been very explicit with them, and where the existing historical debt is material, we have said that the trustee will not accept them rejoining the scheme until the debt is paid. That's what we understand. Now let me just mention double cessation events. A double cessation event is when you've had a cessation event, you've re-entered the scheme, and then you've had another cessation event, and in both cases have not asked for a period of grace, so therefore you've had two cessations. When that happens, there is a legal process that kicks in that we believe is completely unfair because it means counting the debt twice. It's a mathematical thing and it literally doubles the debt. The unfairness of counting a debt twice is obvious to everyone concerned, but it's pleasing to note that the government issued a DWP public consultation in April 2017 entitled the Draft Occupational Pension Schemes Employer Debt Amendment Regulations 2017. Easy for me to say when it's written in front of me. These draft reg regulations paved the way for a possible change in legislation which could result in them only being counted as one cessation event. Now we may not think that our responses to government consultations carry much weight, but in the case of cessation events that would not be true. The pension trustees' input way back in 2015 in the original consultation clearly has had an impact on the shape of the draft legislation regulations. And as employers, we recognise the work that goes on behind the scenes that no one sees and no one gets credit for, but it has, it would appear that it's about to bear fruit in this area. Both the pension trustee and the employers group responded to the consultation. Uh, which for the employers group ran to six pages. The consultation document was technical, but essentially if the proposed regulations come into force, which allow employers to defer their debt, always provided the deficit contributions have been paid and are maintained. The employers group and pension trustees have asked that the regulations be backdated to capture double cessation events that are historical, and the employers group have asked that the three month period of grace that is normal be extended to six months going forward. Those churches that are impacted by cessation events should be aware that the pension trustee has currently suspended pursuit of cessation debts awaiting final regulations. But that snap general election we all enjoyed a few months ago have made the dates uncertain about when DWP will get back to us and will let us know uh, when that legislation is coming into force. Originally we had been hoping for October. So that's a bit about cessation events. At least, yes. The employer's covenant. We're getting near the end folks. Don't panic. Ten minutes and we're done. Put simply, the employer covenant is an assessment of the strength or otherwise of you as employers in the pension scheme to meet your obligations to the pension trustees both now and into the future. So how is this assessment made? The pension trustee will ask for a copy of your church accounts, possibly annually, but at least every three years. Your accounts are then assessed by determining your unrestricted annual income and expenditure together with the amount of unrestricted money that you hold in the bank. Whether you are completing accrual accounts or simple receipt and payment accounts, you must declare both assets held by the church and any liabilities. This is particularly the case with a church which has a pension liability. In a small number of cases, some churches may find that the value of liabilities outstrips the value of assets held. This alone doesn't make a church insolvent. Insolvency means the inability to pay bills when they fall due. In due course, we're going to issue guidelines about what text should accompany the pension liability figure in time for those churches whose year end is 31st of December this year and beyond. But if you take a look at our accounts, you'll see how we've managed it. And there are people around who can give you professional advice in that area. Can I just simply say this? When the pension trustee or anyone else asks for a copy of your accounts, 
You must, by law, submit them. No. No, no, no. The analysis of the employer covenant. Let's just flick on a slide again. Essentially what happens, 2014, property assets with significant value are held. In England, many of them are held in, we're talking about churches and mansions here, many of them are held in trust. They're not actually, not actually owned by the church. That's less common in Scotland. Most of the time they're owned by the church in Scotland, not all of them. A robust level of cash and investment reserves was held by our churches relative to annual expenditure. Many of us have three months sitting there, six months sitting there. Some have a couple of years sitting there. And they took a look at that figure. The 2013 valuation of 84 million funding deficit was deemed to have a strong covenant. We were in a good place, a lot of assets and a lot of cash floating around in our accounts. The deficit would have been much higher if it had assumed a weak covenant. Paper exercise, but it would have had a much higher figure assuming a weak covenant. So the pension regulator has now issued new employer covenant guidance in August 2015, which will apply to, the, to our future going forward. And our ability to contribute cash is the major issue in this. Your ability to fund the deficit contributions both now and into the future is key. This is a big task when one considers the diversity within our churches between those who have and those who have not, and those who have and have the resources to fulfill the aim of clearing the debt. It's a big challenge for us, but it just helps if we've got the information to work with. Now, I'm not going to get you to very, 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 you know, I'm not going to get you to discuss because we don't have time for it. Um, but we need to think about the issue of whether, I want to just catch up with myself if I'm going to skip that bit. Key question, should the employer deficit contributions essentially uh, be aligned to your individual church debt? That's the big question. Is this is a family problem, do we all share equally in our responsibility towards the deficit? Currently, everyone, by a very small number, contribute that flat rate of twelve percent of the minimum pensionable income. Is that right? The flat twelve percent. Sorry. Let me just repeat it then. Do we all share equally in our responsibility towards the deficit? Currently, everyone, by a small number of churches, contribute a flat twelve percent of the minimum pensionable income, that three and a half thousand pounds roughly, we all put in the same, whether your debt is seven and a half thousand or seven hundred and fifty thousand. <laughs> it's slightly adjusted by how many ministers you have, but essentially everybody puts in the 12% flat figure. The question that we need to address is, do we wish to continue to have a flat system or do we wish to start to assign percentage payments towards the actual debt figures estimated that are now being calculated? In other words, if your debt is higher, should you be paying more now? And if your debt is lower, should you be paying less now? Or should we be dealing with it on an equality basis where we all continue to contribute at the same percentage as we have done for the last number of years? We want you to tell us what you think about that. If you agree with aligning deficit contributions to a liability, if you agree with that, do you even think there should be some protection built in for churches who might find themselves having to pay double the amount they're paying just now, or even treble the amount what they're paying just now, perhaps with a capped or phased increase approach? You might have other ideas about how we help one another and what we recommend ultimately to the pension trustees. And I'm going to give you a questionnaire with simple questions to answer on that. In any views you might have on this matter, please consider what you think might be fair, what you think might be just. Just as a snapshot of what that could look like. <laughs> At the moment, we're all paying about 3-4, 
that's not far off the equivalent of roughly 60,000, 55,000 debt. So you can see the variability. If your debt was 200,000, you'd go up to 12,500. If your debt was 25,000, you'd go down to 1,500. And sixty-three pounds, just in rough terms, at the moment. Alan, I'm, I'm not going to take any questions just now. I'll, I will take them later. Thanks very much. Question for you as we come to a close. I have a questionnaire here, and Jenny's going to hand it out so that everybody gets a copy. Feel free to keep your name. Anonymous, if you wish, that is absolutely fine. Equally, feel free to keep the church anonymous as you answer this question. The one part I would ask you not to keep anonymous is the role that you have in the church. It is important to us in gathering this information that we know what is coming from ministers, what is coming from treasurers, what is coming from other leaders in the church. So we would really appreciate if you would answer that question. We then have question number one. The pension scheme principle is that churches should pay deficit contributions in relation to the size of their deficit. We've had this interim situation where we've all been paying the same level. Do you agree that we should make the change and make the deficit contributions relate to the debt that each church has? So it's a yes, no question. If you say yes to that question one, should those churches facing significant increases in contributions be phased in over a period of time from your perspective? Again, yes or no. Question number three relates to the retail price index and the consumer price index that we talked about earlier. Remembering the CPI was the lower figure that affected the pension return of the pensioners going forward with a benefit of 18 uh, million to the fund overall. Do you think that is something that should be put to the pension trustees? That question will be asked again, I believe, in a joint communication from the pension trustees and the employer group in a written formal form to you later on uh, that you will receive by email or post or however you receive these things from them. <coughs> There's a wee question, has it helped you so far? Yes or no? Cause confusion, whatever. And if you have any suggestions that come to mind, um, we'd appreciate you giving them. You have listened very patiently to me. I tried to hold it to an hour. I think I've done it to within the minute. And we're going to say goodbye to those who've joined us live on Facebook and those who are watching uh, the recording later. We're glad you were able to join us in this way and uh, we wish you well and if you have questions pick up the phone to me at the office and we'll see what we can do.